Hi, I'm David Malden, Senior Pastor of Palm City Presbyterian Church in Palm City, Florida. Welcome back to our class on the Essential Tenants. With me today is one of the elders here at Palm City Presbyterian, Rich Porter. Rich, welcome to our class. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, when I joined uh, Palm City Presbyterian uh, four years ago, I had been in search of a church because we had moved from Boca Raton. And uh, originally my search involved uh, looking for a, a black church. And uh, it was important to me because I felt I could serve that community best using my talents and skills. But ultimately I selected uh, Palm City Presbyterian because one, it was important to me that they, the gospel was being preached. Gospel was being preached every week. And that we saw. And secondly, uh, we were warmly welcomed and embraced by the community and the church, which is so important to us. So our decision here was an easy one ultimately. And uh, I uh, thank you for welcoming me today to speak to the congregation. All right, thanks Rich. So today we're talking about covenant life in the church. We're talking about the church. And in our culture today, even many Christians would say that church is something for people who like that sort of thing. If you like church, if that's your thing, that's good, but it's not necessary, even for a Christian, some would say. But the essential tenets have a different view of that, namely that the church isn't what we do, it's who we are. Mm. No, I agree with that. I agree with that. I think that uh, the church is a place where you can, uh, I find it, a place where there is peace uh, there is worship, there is fellowship, and there is music and celebration. And this is, a, a, this is something that's very unique to church life. And I believe that this fellowship, this worship, this gathering of believers is so important to my, my life with Christ. Yeah, following Jesus is a team sport. He made it that way. You can't do it on your own. To follow him, you have to have a a group of people and I'm glad you've had a very positive experience because I know not everybody does and as a pastor I'm very conscious of the disconnect that can exist between our official theology of the church. The Bible says mm -hmm. the church is the body of Christ and the church is holy and the church is all these wonderful things we talk about the church in glowing terms and then the reality for people is that you know, they can find pettiness and gossip and dissension and, and all these sorts of things uh, that make church life less than pleasant. And I, I think the, the issue with church is always that it's people. Mm -hmm. And wherever you have people, you're, you're going to have some issues. And Paul wrote some of his most flowery language about the church to groups of Christians who are having a lot of trouble getting along a lot of trouble following Jesus and living the gospel. They had those old pagan ways and habits and ideas they kept falling back into. And if you had looked at them, you wouldn't think much of the church. But Paul says, hey, there's a reality here that, that's larger than what you see. And you are the people of God. And, and God's grace is at work in you. And, and you should live like that. And so I think... A lot of our teaching about the church is, is aspirational in that we want to live into it. Uh, God makes the church holy, not, not because we always get it right, uh, but because he loves us. Yeah. And we should then try to live into that. Uh, my testimony kind of speaks to what you're talking about. Uh, when I joined Spanish River Church, uh, I was a young believer at that time. And, and that was a church uh, before you came here, when you lived yes, down in Boca. Yes, yeah, and I yeah. lived in Boca. Yeah. Uh, as I grew in the church, I became a deacon, I became an elder, I uh, led a, a men's group, I, I led a study on financial planning, uh, I traveled the world. I would encourage anyone who's considering joining a church to look for those things, the gospel being preached, and a warmth and a fellowship amongst those believers who gather on Sunday. And I appreciate that testimony of, of the church being what the church should be. Mm -hmm. And you continued that here. Uh, you, you serve as, uh, you were a deacon here, you were yes. an elder here. Uh, you have taught a, a financial workshop to uh, high school seniors, college students, yes, and, and served the church in a number of ways and in the community beyond that. And, and your wife continues her work. Uh, she, she heads up our, our counseling, our Stephen ministry yes. here. So, so uh, it's great to see that 
God works in your life and, and then you help to make the church what it needs to be. Yeah? Yeah. Well, let's look at what the essential tenets have to say. Now, this part of the essential tenets begins, we are electing Christ to become members of the community of the new covenant. This covenant which God himself guarantees unites us to God and one another. In other words, for Christians, it's not a question of, oh, do I want to be a part of the church? You are a part of the church because God's covenant, that relationship of promise, when you become a child of God, you have brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. and it's not a question of, do I want these brothers or sisters? There they are. And the question is, are you going to be faithful or not? That's the, that's the question. Already in the creation, we discover that we are made to live in relationships to others, male and female, created together in God's image. In Christ, we are adopted into the family of God and find our new identity as brothers and sisters of one another since we now share one Father. Our faith requires our active participation in the covenant community. Yeah, and the essential tenets here is simply recognize that God created us for relationships. He created us male and female to, to, to have children, to be in families. Uh, we, we are relational creatures. We are. We're, we're made in the we image are. of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we're made for relationships. How then, in our relationship with God, would we not be connected to, to other people? Mm. You know, we're made a, a family of, of faith. And that means that participation in an actual family of faith is mandatory. It's essential for sure. following Jesus. It's not just an optional thing for, for people sure. who like that. There, there are some rare cases where, where people find themselves alone with Jesus. But as I agree with you, uh, people, we as humans are made to be social. Uh, my father always said, uh, you are known by the company you keep. Christians being together in fellowship is one of the beauties of being a part of a church community. And I really believe that uh, uh, I've had more fun as a Christian than I ever believed was possible. Uh, I didn't think Christians had much fun, actually, and uh, that uh, my attitude has certainly changed over the years. The essential tenets continue. Jesus prays that his followers will all be one, and so we both pray and work for the union of the church throughout the world. Even where institutional unity does not seem possible, we are bound to other Christians as our brothers and sisters. Now, obviously, we in ECO don't think that we are the only true church. You know, there, there are other Christians out there in different denominations. On the one hand, that's a tragedy that we can't achieve uh, enough unity to have that institutional unity. Uh, on the other hand, maybe God can work even through our brokenness so that um, each, each denomination has its own personality and maybe can reach people that another one might not. Mm. Yeah, there, there are numerous Christian denominations, and they have some differences. But fundamentally, there are, there are certain things that are universally understood to be Christian values. So you're saying that what unites us as Christians uh, goes much deeper than our differences, even if those differences are not inconsequential. Mm -hmm. Even if we disagree about some very important things, there, there is still a deep level at which we, we share unity in Christ. The essential tenets continue. In Christ, the dividing wall of hostility created by nationality, ethnicity, gender, race, and language differences is brought down. God created people so that the rich variety of his wisdom might be reflected in the rich variety of human beings. And the church must already now begin to reflect the eschatological reality of people from every tribe and tongue and nation bringing the treasures of their kingdoms into the new city of God. There's a beautiful picture at the end of the Bible in the book mm -hmm. of Revelation where people from every nation and language and tribe and tongue are standing before the throne of God as one and worshiping God together. And that picture of unity Mm -hmm. It's so beautiful and so powerful, and that's what we aim for in the church. Absolutely. And it's, it's sort of countercultural because in the world, there are so many differences that divide. Divisions between rich and poor, racial divisions, nationality, all those different things that the world says are important. Mm -hmm. And in Christ, all of that is transcendent. The essential tenets continue. 
Within the covenant community of the church, God's grace is extended through the preaching of the word, the administration of the sacraments, and the faithful practice of mutual discipline. And we know the true church is, uh, is identified by uh, the word being rightly preached, the sacraments being rightly administered, and the church discipline being rightly practiced. And these, these are marks of the church. Yeah, the essential tenets break these down. So they, the essential tenets say, first, through the work of the Holy Spirit, the word proclaimed may indeed become God's address to us. The Spirit's illuminating work is necessary both for the one who preaches and those who listen. So God speaks to us through the sermon. Yes, we certainly hope so, that the Holy Spirit is at work both in the preacher right. and in the one listening. And I can tell you, I see the Holy Spirit at work sometimes because after the sermon, people will come up and, and say that they, they got something out of God spoke to them and what they got out was not what I put in, right? So, so it's a sermon maybe about uh, the importance of, of prayer and how your mm -hmm. prayer life needs, needs to be better. And someone will come up and say, you know, I, I really appreciated this. And God was really speaking to me about the need to forgive my spouse. And I'm like, wow, okay, that's wonderful. I'm <laughs> glad that, that they got it. But I think what happens sometimes is people, people have where they're at mm -hmm. in their spiritual life and the needs and concerns that they have and and then you have the, the sermon and somehow the Holy Spirit brings those together mm. and, uh, and and does some amazing things sometimes. Mm. Sometimes you can be reading the Bible and sometimes even, even hearing a sermon and you feel like God's saying something to me. Sure, I understand. Yeah, the, I think the patron saint of preachers is Balaam's donkey. Because in the, in the Old Testament, right, Balaam is this prophet and he's going to do something God doesn't want him to do. And his donkey stops and talks to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if God can deliver his message through a donkey, God can deliver his message through, through any of us. So, mm, understood. Yeah. Understood. All right, so uh, it also talked about the sacraments. And we recognize two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the word sacrament is an interesting word. It's a very churchy word. And basically, there, there are four components to a sacrament. First of all, Jesus told us to do it. So it's something that, that he told us to do. And then there is a physical action and material involved. Mm -hmm. There's a spiritual reality that it points to and signifies. And there's a promise attached to it. So we, we think about baptism. Jesus told us to baptize. And the physical action and sign is pouring water or, or immersing in water. Uh, we do it both ways. Mm -hmm. And the spiritual reality is new life in Christ that that, that points to. And, and the promise of God is that those who have faith in Jesus Christ are his children through faith. So, so all of that goes together. In the Lord's Supper, um, the, the materials are obviously the, the bread and the wine, or, or we use the unfermented wine that mm -hmm. you use, right? So, so uh, and the eating and drinking is the action, and the spiritual reality is that we're fed on the, the body and blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, the spiritual reality is His death for us, and, and the promise is that we are saved through His death. Mm -hmm. So those four elements make a sacrament, and now the essential tenets, I think, have more to say about the sacrament. Second, the sacraments of baptism and the and the Lord's Supper are signs that are linked to the things signifying, sealing us to the promises of Jesus. In the baptism of infants, we confess our confidence in God's gracious initiative that a baby cannot turn to God is nonetheless claimed as a member of the covenant community, a child of God cleansed by grace and sealed by the Spirit. In the baptism of adults, we confess our confidence that God's grace can make us new creations in any stage of our lives. Baptism is a sign and a seal of the covenant of grace, a mark of the entrance into the visible church. And it is the Holy Spirit who makes the sacrament effectitious in God's time to those who God has called. Yes, that's certainly quite a lot. Uh, yes. You know, thinking about baptism, some people uh, 
there are churches that, that only baptize believers. We baptize uh, people who have not been baptized before mm -hmm. as adults if they've never been baptized. We also baptize infants. The reason that we baptize infants is that uh, we believe that that child is a part of the covenant community and so that child is baptized with the understanding that baptism does not save the, the infant who is baptized. That person will someday have to profess their own faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, but the fact that we baptize them before they're able to do that points to God's gracious initiative in, in reaching out to us. Uh, that it's, it, we're not the ones who takes the first step. God takes the first step. Uh, some of my friends in churches that don't baptize infants will say, how do you know that child will do that? To which I say, well, if you baptize a college student, how do you know that person in 30 years is still going to be mm. a professing Christian? Mm. You, you baptize in hope. And so at some point, an infant who is baptized will have to be confirmed. And that is where uh, they step forward and say, yes, this is who I am. I'm a follower of Jesus. Uh, this is how I, I'm going to be. I own my baptism. And so there's a process for doing that. I think whether you're baptized as an infant or an adult, the meaning of baptism is the same. And we see it in Jesus' baptism, where John the Baptist baptizes Jesus and the Holy Spirit descends as a dove. And God in heaven, the Father, says, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Mm. And I think that baptism is God's way of saying to us, you are my son, you are my daughter, with you I am well pleased. Mm. For me, uh I was baptized in an immersion ceremony. Uh, which uh, some denominations uh, sprinkle and others immerse, but this is not a deal breaker for Christians. This is yeah, because we, we do both. We, right. I we understand. Our church, I understand. Yeah. I understand. And uh, but for me, it was an affirmation of my love for Christ. And uh, a very, it was a very simple ceremony and very short. But uh, I was moved by it, and I will never forget that day that I was immersed. The essential tenets say, in the Lord's Supper, we confess that as we eat the bread and share one cup, the Spirit unites us to the ascended Christ so that his resurrection life may nourish, strengthen, and transform us. I don't think anything divides the different denominations as much as the understanding of the Lord's Supper. There are those who believe that the bread and the wine literally become the body and blood of Christ. There are those who say, well, it's purely symbolic. And we're sort of in the middle here because we believe that when we eat and drink in faith, we receive Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't chew him with our teeth such that the bread and the wine become literally the body and blood of Christ, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, when we eat and drink in faith, we do receive Jesus Christ and the whole of Christ, spiritual and his body. So we receive the body and blood of Christ spiritually through the power of the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit. Uh, when we eat and drink. And that makes the Lord's Supper a very powerful experience of, of faith. He gave us that sacrament to unite us with himself and to assure us that his death was for us and that we are his children. Is it, is it unique to our church that uh, you ask those who, are not, who have not accepted Jesus, who are not believers, to not partake? Uh, is that something unique to our church? Uh, it's not. Pretty much any Christian church would say that the Lord's Supper is for those who have faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And in our church, that is the only requirement. So someone could be a member of a different church, a different mm -hmm. denomination. It, it doesn't matter. If they have faith in Christ, they're invited to partake because it's not our table, it's his table. Third, the community of the church practices discipline in order to help one another along the path to a new life, speaking the truth in love to one another, bearing one another's burdens, and offering to one another the grace of Christ. So the issue of church discipline is an interesting one. In ECO, church discipline is exercised largely through mutual accountability. Uh, this, is, this is where we know and care for one another, and we speak into another person's life. So if you see someone who is... Uh, who's maybe taking their life in a direction that's not healthy, that's not good. You, you speak into that person's life. Now, it is the case that a pastor or elder or deacon could be removed from mm -hmm. office in the case of serious sin. Fortunately, it doesn't happen a lot, uh, but, but that is something that exists. Mm -hmm. There's one standard for all Christians. 
it's just more important that those who are in leadership adhere to that that standard. Mm. So we, we really envision in terms of mutual accountability. In fact, in ECO, all pastors are required to be part of a pastor accountability group, a pastor covenant group, uh, where you have three or four pastors and you uh, know each other and your life and your ministry and your struggles. And so you're able to help and encourage and speak into one another's mm -hmm. lives that way. Uh, this is a question not kind of off the cuff, but how does that, how does that relate to the body of the church, the members of the church? Are they asked to hold one another accountable as they perceive someone who is doing something that is not biblically or scripturally uh, 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 in line with, uh, with what we believe? Is there some, is it really important that we hold one another accountable as a church body, not just the deacons and elders and our pastoral staff? Yeah. Well, you certainly want to avoid legalism, right? Or, or being a busybody. And in, we've probably all met those, those people who think that they're, they're put mm -hmm. on, on here on earth by God to correct everybody else and, sure. and set them straight. And, and you know, they're good at finding faults, right? Mm -hmm. but they have the spiritual gift of nitpicking. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, so, so you want to avoid that. But I think also in, in a church, you want to love one another enough that you're there when someone needs you. Mm -hmm. You're there to support and encourage. And I think about uh, a, a young man I, I knew years and years ago, and he was a drug addict. And a church, his church was helping him to get his life clean and, and straight. And that required love, it required some tough love, it required being there and investing some time in, in his life. Uh, but with the help of his church, and he never would have made it on his own, but he got clean sure. through the help of his church. And so I think it's not so much about you know policing one another no. as it is about caring for one another. And, and so sometimes you might say to one of your friends, hey, you, you having some trouble? Mm -hmm. Anything I could do, and, sure. and reaching out and, and expressing it in terms of care more than and, the criticism and love, yeah. love and caring. Understand? Yeah, understand. Yeah. Well, Rich, thank you so much for for being here, and uh, and appreciate what you have have brought to the table today, and appreciate your ministry here in our church. And thank you uh, for being a part of this as well. We look forward to seeing you next time as our series on the essential tenets continues. Mm -hmm.